Well, good morning or good day. Welcome to In the Clock Tower. Uh, this is Pastor Chris Byers just uh, here to welcome you into another uh, session or series, uh, another installment of In the Clock Tower uh, as we continue and we go through uh, the, the Bible study that we went through in adult Sunday school this morning over here at St. John's. Uh, and uh, that way you can feel a part of this if you're home. Uh, hopefully you've been able to download uh, the link that you'll find at the top of the site there that uh, for when you started this, so you'd be able to follow along or you've had this sent to you uh, to feel free. We do use, uh, we're back to going back to the seed, um, which is Sola Publishing. Uh, and we're using their curriculum uh, as we are working together with our youth. The goal, of course, is to try and have us be on the same page. And as things return to normalcy, that'll help us also have those intergenerational conversations to be able to talk about what do we learn together in the Word of God. Uh, this was a very interesting session here. Uh, there were some things that uh, we did go through uh, that uh, didn't apply to the study, uh, and I'll cover that here briefly, but mostly I do want to get to the study here. Uh, let's open up in, in prayer. You'll find this on the top of your page if you downloaded that. Uh, it's uh, Lesson 4, uh, Joseph Explains His Dreams. Uh, we're going to be going through Genesis 40, verses 1 through 23. Uh, so let's pray. Holy God, You have given each of us skills and talents that we may worship you and serve our neighbors. Help us to use the gifts you give us for your purposes, that your will and plan for salvation may be made known in all the earth. We pray this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, this uh, section we're going on, introduction here, is Joseph had been the favorite of uh, Jacob's 12 sons, but his jealous brothers sold him into slavery in Egypt through further misfortune, was put in prison, but God did not abandon him. The Lord revealed his power through Joseph by the interpretation of dreams. And this is just one segment of that. First off, as we before we get into the reading, I do want to discuss one of the things that did come out in the class, and and I think it's it's a good thing for us to talk about. Uh, But I don't want to spend too much time on it, because I do want to get into the study here in in and of itself. One of the great things, especially since uh, the tragic events that occurred on uh, January 6th, there's been a lot of discussion, a lot of talk, a lot of there's a lot of anxiety that we feel in our nation at this time. And that did come out in, the, in our class today. And one thing I want us to be focused on is we as people of the word need to, need to stay in the word. Um, there's issues that we can see going on within the Congress, uh, particularly one where the languages is where there's been a change in how raw laws and things can be written uh, so that gender specific terms and things are now being removed and are not allowed for within our laws, which does have a large implication uh, for our nation and, of course, was highlighted by uh, the pastor and uh, the congressman who is a pastor who closed his prayer with amen and a woman uh, or women. Um, One thing about amen, I want you to understand. (laughs) Amen. The men on that has no uh, gender specific understanding there. It is a Hebrew word. Amen. We use it uh, in English and it transliterates into English as A M E N. Uh, that is not a masculine term uh, in that sense that it's meant to speak to the gender of man or men. Uh, the amen just means let it be so, or uh, and it's just a we 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 have it taken from the Hebrew amen, um, and we say amen, um, and it's just a Hebrew word <laughs> that uh, truly is not so there is no english weight to it in that um so that's just silliness on our part now what's really uh what really needs to be looked at and addressed and what it did highlight one is ignorance but two it also highlights how even how there's such this move to make sure that nothing sounds like uh men or masculine it's sort of like those that go his story and her story uh honestly it's just it's not how language works, uh, but it's also something that's just 
uh, we probably should have more discussions on. But this isn't really the place to do it. Ultimately, though, what we need to realize with everything going on in our nation and our world today, we need to focus on this one reality. And let's put a pin in a lot of this anxiety that we're dealing with in this. That Jesus Christ is still Lord. No matter what, Jesus, God, he is still in control. As Christians, that is ultimately where we should place our focus and in whom we should place our trust. Uh, we are not to worship our presidents. So I'm going to tell you right now, the idols that we need to break in our world today is Trump, Biden, vaccine. Those are three big ones right now. There's, there's quite a few other ones that are there that I'm sure that if you put on there, but if you are putting your hope and your trust in something that's not Jesus Christ, that's an idol. And honestly, we need to stop. <laughs> we need to let it go. Um, we need to, uh, as uh, I've kind of thought in my mind, is my kids really love Frozen and Frozen 2 and uh, you know, in Frozen, the song Elsa sings, let it go. We need to be like Elsa, let it go. Uh, we need to not worry about so much of these things that have nothing to do with our salvation. Now, that doesn't mean we need that, that we should just put blinders on and act like negative things aren't happening. But they should not dictate how we are reacting. They should only dictate to us how we how, how we, we need to pray. And quite honestly, we do need to be on our knees and praying. There's also videos and things going on out there that are being put out by people and they all have the same theme, it seems. You know, you have some guy with a real thick drawl says he's, I'm gonna, I, I just got off a phone call with certain people and got some information I got to share with you. Um, just because they put on a draw um, doesn't make it reliable um, and doesn't uh, make it more trustworthy, in my opinion, um, just because it makes them seem down-home good old folk. Um, reality would be is let's just not worry about and, and let those things guide or dictate how we feel. Uh, be very careful about a lot of that misinformation that we're finding out there. If there is truth behind it, it will come out. Um, but I'm going to tell you right now, um, most places, I, I, I highly doubt that, uh, that some somebody that has no higher position uh, in government or in leadership is going to be uh, called in and brought into a secret meeting that's going to reveal classified information. So let's just stop with that and focus on Jesus Christ as Lord, as Christians, and focus on what we can do and how we can best impact our world. Uh, that's just my, I guess, my PSA that I'm going to add on to this. Um, let's, uh, let's take a moment and take a breath and let's breathe. Let's pray for our nation. Let's pray for President Trump. Let's pray for President-elect Joe Biden. Let's pray for our Congress. Let's, I would even say pray for Nancy Pelosi, for many who I know might have a struggle with that there, Lord, with, with her and all. But we need to pray for her, as well as uh, Senator Schumer and, and also Senator McConnell and everybody in leadership. We just need to pray. And pray for them, not against them, uh, but pray for them because they all need our prayers, and they all need to. They all need, and we do pray that they look to the Lord for guidance in everything. And we are His, and that's ultimately my PSA: is pray, and don't get caught up in a in. in a fur, a furor of fear, because there is nothing really to fear. We belong to Christ and Christ alone. All right, so that's enough on that. Um, I'm going to back off with that right now because I want to get into this study, um, but I did want to. I do feel I feel compelled to say that in 
And I just want our hearts to be at ease and at peace because quite frankly, uh, there's too much in this world that can trouble our spirits. Uh, and, uh, Let's, let's find the word to calm our spirits and quell those fears. Be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. So don't put blinders on, but don't believe everything that's just put out there by so-and-so. And, uh, and just be watchful and be thoughtful and continue to pray and read your Bible. Read your Bible and pray. So talking about reading our Bible, let's open up our Bibles to Genesis 40 verses 1 through 23. I'm going to put it on my Logos so that way we can follow along, but I hope you'll look on your own Bible and be able to follow along with that too. So here you go. We are in Genesis 40. We'll start and I will read here. Sometime after this, the cupbearer of the king of Egypt and his baker committed an offense against their lord, the king of Egypt. And Pharaoh was angry with his two officers, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. And he put them in custody in the house of the captain of the guard in the prison where Joseph was confined. The captain of the guard appointed Joseph to be with them, and he attended them. They continued for some time in custody. And one night they both, had, they both dreamed. The cupbearer and the baker of the king of Egypt, who were confined in the prison, each his own dream, and each dream with its own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning, he saw that they were troubled. So he asked Pharaoh's officers, who were with them in custody in the master's house, Why are your faces downcast today? They said to him, We have had dreams, and there is no one to interpret them. And Joseph said to them, do not, uh, do not interpretations belong to God? Please tell them to me. So the chief cupbearer told his dream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream there was a vine before me, and on the vine were three branches. As soon as it budded, its blossoms shot forth, and the clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup, and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly, when you were his cupbearer. Only remember me when it is well with you, and please do me the kindness to mention me to Pharaoh, So and so get me out of this house. For I was indeed stolen out of my land of the Hebrews, and here I have also done nothing that should put me into the pit. When the chief baker saw that the interpretation was favorable, he said to Joseph, I also had a dream. There were three cake baskets on my head, and in the uppermost basket there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh. But the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head, and Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. The three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree, and the birds will eat the flesh from you. On the third day, which was Pharaoh's birthday, he made a feast for all his servants and lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the chief cupbearer to his position. And he placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand, but he hanged the chief baker, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. All right, so we're what's going on here? I guess this is a good question. On reading these verses, what are some of your initial impressions and questions? What stands out to you? Um, uh, we kind of got distracted at this point of it all and kind of went in other directions for a little bit, but we did get back into the study here. Uh, one of the things that I would like to point out a lot of these unreading these verses is some of the initial impressions on this is, uh, you know, here he has these dreams. He's in prison. We know that uh, Joseph had done nothing wrong. He was uh, lifted up into a good position. One of the things that was on there is we're talking about the cupbearer uh, and they were chiefs. You know, these this was like the head butler 
and this was the head baker. These were not just the lowly guys, but these were the guys that were over the others too. So they had some pretty good power. They were officers. And also uh, the fact that Joseph was thrown into prison. Potiphar was the, he was the prison warden. He, and these prisons at this time, this is one thing we did talk about. These prisons at this time, they weren't like the prisons we know today. I mean, if you were to be imprisoned in the United States, of course, yeah, you, there's, the, there's the negativity of incarceration. You're not able to be close to some, uh, but you have a, you're guaranteed a bed. You also have meals and medical care. You have all of those things you need. At the time of, of Joseph and at the time of others, this was, I mean, one of the things is, is Joseph is given authority over him. One question that was asked is like, uh, that was brought up is because he was tending to these two, so they could have been beaten. We don't know; it doesn't say. But Joseph may have been one who nursed them; was nursing them back to health after they were beaten or whipped or something of that nature. Uh, so we don't know exactly how long they were in there uh, before they had these dreams, and we don't. But see, Joseph was again in a position of caring for others. See, prior to being thrown in prison, Potiphar had made him; so he was. He, he was found to be very trustworthy. So Potiphar uh, made him to be uh, a kind of um, the second in command of all of his property and things. And then, of course, Potiphar's wife, if you've read it, and if you recall reading in scripture on there, Potiphar's wife thought Joseph was, found Joseph to be very attractive and uh, desired to be with him. Joseph, being a man of character, didn't, would not have done that to his, his master. Uh, so he refused and uh, she entrapped him and then lied. Uh, basically, uh, when she tried to force herself upon him, he ran away and then she acted as though he had tried to force her, him on, on her. So the reverse was there. Uh, but so, so Joseph indeed was in jail for no reason. He also was in prison by his siblings um, when he was thrown into the pit. Uh, I mean, quite honestly, Joseph was kind of a pip. Uh, he, he, uh, he didn't think very clearly and kind of was like the kid who had a treat and said, hey, I'm better than you. Uh, and his brothers didn't like it. Their, their punishment was definitely harsh. Um, but we know, uh, being a father of six, uh, something I had to adjust to is siblings will have their squabbles, and it's normal. Uh, and you're not going to be able to resolve them all, and you're not going to be able to stop them all. Um, so those were a few things that kind of came out on this. And, uh, it's quite fascinating as you, as you, as we were opening this up and talking about it. Now, where you find this is right in the first section of scripture, if you know, right in Genesis, the first book. Uh, and honestly, uh, this is the, uh, the whole story of Joseph is the last segment of Genesis prior to Exodus, which, uh, is what leads us up to when the, when the uh, Hebrew people are uh, in Egypt and they have been put into slavery in Egypt and then uh, eventually are freed uh, through Moses. So if you kind of want to know a context of where it is in scripture, that's a good way to look at it. Just to give a brief context, if uh, just in case you're not as aware or familiar of, of how it all works, it's always good to also think about that and review that. Um, the first question that we looked at here uh, in the discussion questions that are on the sheet is, at the time of the story, Joseph was in Egypt. Did Joseph deserve to be in prison? So we look at 15. Uh, do you remember who sold Joseph into slavery in the first place? Now, I did touch on to that there at the time of the story. He, was, he didn't deserve to be in prison. As we look back, he was falsely imprisoned. Um, we know about if you read through the scripture and you read prior to his imprisonment, uh, Potiphar's wife had tried to entrap him. Uh, he was sold originally into slavery uh, by his brothers, his siblings. Uh, initially, they thought, well, we'll kill him. But uh, Reuben, one of his brothers, said, no, no, we can't do that. Uh, let's just put him in this pit and then we'll act like he's been and then he thought, Reuben had thought he would save his brother later. Uh, unfortunately, then uh, they had some slave traders, Midianites went by, and they sold him into slavery. And then he eventually was sold to uh, be a slave to Potiphar in Egypt. And uh, that's kind of where that all began. Um, but 
Um, it all became pretty with some harsh treatment from his siblings. I mean, I pray, I know my kids, they fight back and forth, but I, I would pray none of them would ever want to do something like that, even wanting to kill them. I hope they never want to, but I hope they'd never wish they could sell them into slavery either. I mean, that just sounds a little extreme, if, if you want my opinion there. Now, when we go, uh, so we're going to continue to move on on here and uh one of the two men used to second question used to have a job serving as pharaoh's waiter or butler what did this man dream about what did joseph tell him in his dream tell him his dream meant what later happened to this man now this was a fascinating discussion as we look through that too and it's a fascinating part of the scripture if you think about it um it's pretty clear cut, but it's also showing how God works. I mean, one of the things that you might want to ask yourself is why would God focus on dreams and things like that? Well, you know, we, we have to understand that God can use dreams. Now you have to test it. It's not like saying we should do and buy dream interpretation books uh, and think about that. No, no. What we're talking about here is uh, when, when, when he, uh, when when God puts a dream in a person's heart or, or something of that to be able to tell something, it usually it, it well, it will come to fruition. For example, I'm just going to go back over here. For example, when when you have a if you have a dream, and there are many people today that talk about dreams and visions, and God can still work through those most certainly. Uh, most of them though, on on the time. I'll, I'll, if you can't have an interpreter on them, I mean, I wouldn't put much credence or power into them. And if there are, if they seem to be vague, um, the one thing that we're going to find about that is, see, God does not um, allow prophets to be vague. They have to be very specific. Uh, and they have to be in line with the word of God and what God is trying to do. So those are a couple of things that are important uh, to always think about when we're looking at those, because uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of uh, false prophets that are out there, and they'll talk about dreams and and, and things like that, and 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 sometimes they talk in such vagaries. Um, but you see, if it's a prophetic dream, as God had as God had given these two men, and then they had laid put out there with uh, Joseph to be able to interpret those dreams. One, Joseph was given that power to glorify God, not for himself. It wasn't to make him seem to be extra wise. The wisdom comes from God and, and God alone. And Joseph says that himself here, and I'm going to go right back to it. Uh, Joseph says says this when he when he hears about the dreams and knowing that god has used him or given him god had given him insight on these things he goes do not interpretations belong to god please tell them to me so what that does highlight is that joseph was a man who was in a prayer he was he was he knew that god had work was work at work with him this was known early on as part of the reason why his brothers had such issue with him because he had a dream that he told to his father and it was that they would that he and his siblings that his father and all all of his siblings would bow down to him now we know that that does come true but it sounds like it, it doesn't sound like a positive thing you want to tell your siblings is i'm better than you uh that tends to make people angry if you try and say that you are going to be uh bowing down to me. It's kind of like when you're having a discussion with something, somebody on other things, which I don't know about you, but uh, one thing I've that I've had happen to me um, is I'm in a discussion with people that are friends of mine online, and I've had some, I've had uh, some in particular, one in particular I can think of in the moment, and of saying they demand my response or demand my view. Well, um, for the the problem with that is is uh, uh, that's trying to place somebody else in authority. And uh, you know, Joseph on one side is God had given this, but uh, God hadn't revealed to the others that He would be the one in authority. Um, so obviously. And there was nothing to be said about that they would definitely be that he would definitely be placed in authority other than his dream. Uh, so I'm sure his brothers were kind of like, "Who do you think you are, um, placing yourself above me?" Um, 
But uh, God had some plans, and uh, Joseph had some great humbling. You have to figure with him being imprisoned, it did humble him greatly. While him being enslaved and then being imprisoned, I'm sure, was a, a, a very strong humbling act. And we do see how he grows into this. As a kid, he probably, when he was younger and what happened with his brothers, prior to his brothers is a lot because he was, he, he was a kid at the time and he thought himself probably better than he should have and uh, on that. But I'm not going to beat that anymore. Uh, that sounds like a good drum. I think I'm done, done with that one. Um, but when we think about this interpretation or when we talk about these is, uh, you know, it says no one to interpret. Um, and this is from Luther's, uh, what Luther says, um, which is a great book if you happen to find a copy of it. I, I do have one, thankfully, in my library that was uh, given to me um, but because uh, it's an older book, and it's just a quick way of being able to find some Luther's references out there. Um, but Luther says, Since certain instances strongly prove that dreams can be may be meaningful, they are not to be entirely rejected. However, to be of value, dreams must, as Paul says of prophesying in Romans 12, 7, be according to the analogy of faith. But how to know whether God or the devil inspired a dream cannot be taught by rules. Experience must reveal it. Um, so there's no clear, fast rule on how do we know uh, this is a dream from God or a dream from Satan. Uh, it can't be taught. It only can be felt through prayer. And it needs to be in line with the Word of God and, and, and using what God's means are for. As we see with this dream, what does happen? What what happens to the cupbearer is, and and what does he dream? And what is, and what does Joseph say? In my dream, there was a vine before me, and on that vine there were three. And I think about three is such a vital number within our faith. It points to the Trinitarian formula, um, but here we see it as a, as pointing to days. As soon as it budded, its blossom shot forth. The clusters ripened into grapes. Pharaoh's cup was in my hand. I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. And he interprets it, it this way. This is its interpretation. The three branches are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office. And you shall place Pharaoh's cup in his hand as formerly when you were his cup bearer. Um, so, here is so this was a good interpretation. It was a valid and and fine interpretation for him. The pharaoh, the cupbearer, the butler, waiter, uh, however you want to determine that he was he knew that this was something that was going to be positive. He had a very positive outcome there, and he had only one thing: only remember me when it is well with you, and please do the kindness to mention to Pharaoh so to get me out of my house. And then he explains his story of how he ended up where he was. Um, now, some would argue, you can argue on this, and you know, some would go, well, this would be like taking payment for it. Well, not necessarily, because God had given him this gift, so that way he, he would be able to find a way of getting out of that place. Um, you know, so it wasn't something that, uh, that he sought on his own, he sought in an essence necessary way, saying, "Well, I want to get wealthy on this." He was just saying, "I've been wrongly imprisoned, and I want you to make sure that I am able, that I can get out, I can be free." Um, and as Luther says here, is his explanation. He says, "Therefore, Joseph did not sin when he requested the king's butler um, uh, to give consideration to his liberation, for at the very outset he sobbed and begged his brothers not to sell him, because at that time he was unable to avoid being delivered by his brothers into the sad and wretched servitude of foreigners. He bore patiently the cross imposed by the Lord, to be sure. But now when he sees that another opportunity for freedom is being offered through the chief of the butlers of the court of the king, in whose good graces he knew the butler would be, he thinks he will be he he will hazard finding out whether the Lord would be willing to further this opportunity and rescue him from such an irksome imprisonment. So he wasn't asking for specific payment in the essence. He knew the gift was of God. He knew that the interpretation came from God, and he trusted in what God's word was saying and doing. Um, so so that would be. Uh, a good thing we know what happened later the man is in three days he was lifted up he gave the pharaoh his his wine 
a, the cup was placed back into his hand, to which he could give. But he he was able to place that cup into the Pharaoh's hand, so he was restored. We knew there was a specific time frame, and there was a specific thing that was going to happen, and the fact that that's what happened shows that God was there. That's one thing about prophecy. If it doesn't happen, or if it's vague, uh, one prophecies are never vague. Two, they will happen as they say. Um, there is there is no vagary. It should be easy, especially in the interpretation uh, of a prophecy. If there is anything vague, run, run as far as you can. Never trust a never trust a false prophet. Now, because of that, we get to the next question, and I'm going to read that real quickly here. What did the baker say happened in his dream, and what did Joseph tell him in this moment? What later happened? Well, we read in here, the baker said he saw it was good. He told his dream. He said there would be three cake baskets. So we got that three again on my head. In the uppermost basket, there were all sorts of baked food for Pharaoh, but the birds were eating it out of the basket on my head. And Joseph answered and said, this is its interpretation. Three baskets are three days. In three days, Pharaoh will lift up your head from you and hang you on a tree. And the birds will eat the flesh from you. So this was a much more brutal interpretation, but it didn't, but there was not a lot of hope in it, right? Um, he would have been, so what was going on with the with this guy? Why, why was there, uh, so somewhere or another, this guy had done something pretty shady. We don't know. Maybe he tried to poison Pharaoh, and that's what he was caught up doing here. Uh, but obviously we know that the interpretation that's given to him and what God is saying is going to happen, it happens, uh, and it's a brutal punishment there for him. Uh, but we also know as we read through this is that for a period of time, you know, we, we, we get these. What later happened to this man? Everything that was said. So was Joseph able to explain these dreams because he was smart? Well, obviously no. And that's even even what Joseph says. Because in verse 8, he says it's from God, right? Uh, who does reveal that wisdom? And then the next, and that's where the next question, who is the one who reveals wisdom? God and God alone. As Christians, where or how does God teach us his wisdom? As Christians, ultimately, we want to go to the word of God. That's the basis and the primary basis of where we find our wisdom there. Um, can God give us visions? Can God visit, give us dreams? Can God give us prophetic? Uh, obviously, he can. Um, we need to be very careful of that, though. Uh, ultimately, God has revealed himself wholly in the word of God, and we should trust in that fully in our lives. And that should be the center, the sole norm of our faith in life. Uh, the word of God is not fallible. We are, and our interpretations can be fallible. Uh, our thoughts are fallible. Our feelings are fallible. Uh, but God's word is not fallible. It's also inerrant. It's without error. We are the ones that are in error. Sometimes we can read things incorrectly. Uh, that's why we should read the word and we should pray continually. If something in the word is troubling our spirits, we pray over it. We don't, we don't write it off or act as if it doesn't say what it says. Excuse me. We struggle through that. And that's the, that is the truth of what, what we're told to do through God is through the word of God. When we continue to be in his word, he will open and reveal to us things that are going to help us in our lives. That's what the word is for. It is our ultimately, that is our sole norm for faith in life. That is, that is our primary source. We can pray and through prayer, the word is opened and we are given greater understanding. Uh, so that is why it is also important as we read the word of God to pray to God that he continually open our hearts and our minds to understand what it is that he is doing and how he's doing. And we continually do that. Uh, we don't allow the, anything else to be causing us to go right or left, but keep our eyes focused on what's most important. Um, so uh, how does Joseph serve as an example of how we should act when things do not go our way? 
Um, well, Joseph continued to serve others when he was in prison. Does it being in a bad situation? This is a good one to think about. Being in a bad situation mean we stop caring for other people? No. When things are rough, we should care for others. We shouldn't hold back or be afraid. We should be willing to share and give and and help to the point uh, help those that are in need. How does Joseph serve as an example of how we should act when things do not go our way? Well, we just we serve as an example of how we should act when things go our way. Be, just like Joseph did, he just kept doing as he knew to do. He didn't sit there crying and whining and blaming God for everything. Um, so often that's that's the thing we struggle with. And nominal Christianity is no help for that. Um, being nominal in the faith uh, is, is almost uh, is, is harder, I, I would argue. I, I don't know. And understand, I've had, I've walked out of the faith, um, and I've been called back into it. I don't know that I've ever been really nominally faithful in the in the truest sense that I see today. Um, and I, I see a lot of struggles with people that are nominally faithful, uh, especially when bad things happen. You know, why do good things happen or bad things happen to good people? Uh, thank you, Rabbi Kushner, a good Jew uh, that did that. He only had half the half the Bible, so he had only half of all the scriptures. He had only the Old Testament. Um, to he didn't get the rest of the story. Um, so. Uh, you know, bad things happen because of sin. Um, and the reality is, as uh, Lisa Anderson pointed out today, and as others have in, uh, in the past, is none of us are good. Uh, not one. And that is a, a valid argument in our minds. Are we, are we good? What do we deserve? Um, do we deserve anything good to happen in our lives? Do we deserve the love that God has for us? No, we, we deserve nothing. We are all broken and fallen sinners that deserve any ounce of punishment that we receive. But gracefully, God loves us. He restores us. He lifts us up. He lifts our heads up, not in the sense where like the baker, but like the cupbearer. He he sees this that are broken and 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 he restores us us as we trust in him we trust in his love we trust in his mercy we trust in his care it's a constant practice that god calls us to and that's that's where we find our hope so uh in difficult times what do we do we pray and we continue to do what god calls us today now Let's end up here. The last question as we go, and I'm going to look again on the Lagos, and uh, we're going to go through this last question. And it says, or last two questions, our story today ends on a bad note, but eventually Joseph was set free to become Pharaoh's top advisor, Genesis 41 through 37 to 41. Why is it important to not lose hope when things look bad? See, we, we have the, what happens is Pharaoh's birthday happens. It comes and goes. He made the chief priest, uh, he made a feast. We have the chief baker who is the, lifted up the head of the chief cupbearer and the head of the chief baker among his servants. He restored the cupbearer to his position and placed the cup in Pharaoh's hand. But he hanged the chief baker and Joseph, as Joseph had interpreted to them. Yet the chief cupbearer did not remember Joseph, but forgot him. So this would be a hopeless, you know, some might look at that period, and he could have, because he ended up spending quite a few years. Um, if you read a little further, it was after two whole years um, before uh, Joseph is remembered. So Joseph is in prison for all the years prior, wondering if he'll ever get out. He didn't do anything wrong. And then two years after he sees the cupbearer lifted up, he had done everything to care for him, and the cupbearer forgot him. For two years in prison, he continued to have to live and serve in there, uh, knowing that he was there unjustly. He didn't do anything to deserve that. Um, but what we find in here is he continually does, I think, you know, as we understand, Joseph did what Joseph did. He just did what needed to be done. And that is something that we are called to also look to in our lives. Uh, is that we as Christians should no matter what do what Christians do. You know, you come to uh, the whole 
reality of uh, when we think about um, the reality of who we are and who we are in Christ, um, we aren't defined by our circumstances, the situation. We are defined by our Lord and Him alone. So, you know, in this time that we find ourselves in right now, which I know that there's just a lot of struggle all around. I mean, I don't care what party you're with, there's still struggle. Some some are looking at, I mean, January 6th um, was should, should trouble everyone because what we saw there is just, it was it was it was not good for our country. Um, the summer should still be struggling, causing all of us what happened over the summer and all the events that we saw this past summer. Uh, as we've had endured through this COVID nineteen, uh, there are so many things that we have faced throughout even just this year uh, that should that that we need to reflect on and pray about. But ultimately, we are Christians. And we do what Christians do. We worship God. And we're not afraid. We don't sit in fear. We don't worry. We just do what we do. We pray. And that's something, ultimately, that I'm, I'm going to call us all to at all times, is let us pray. Um, the last question, and it points to this, is read John 8. 31 through 36. So let's transition back and let us read what we find uh, in, 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 uh, in 31 through 36. And it says, So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, If you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you how you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who practices sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. And the questions that's asked there is the truth will set you free. If we are all slaves to sin, as Jesus says, how does the promise of Jesus set us free? Well, Jesus, he took on the bonds of all sin upon himself. The sinless one became sin. He was the one who knew no sin, but he became sin. Not because it made him, because he needed to do that, but because he chose that for us. And he did so, so that we could know the Father. He did that out of grace. He did that out of mercy. There was nothing, and there is nothing that we can do to ever merit it, to ever deserve it, but we can accept it, knowing that God loves us. He is our God, and will always be our God. And no fear should ever enter into our hearts because of anything that we see going on in our world today, because we know, we know where our hope lies. And our hope lies in our Lord, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. So that's the one thing I hope you'll find great peace in with this, is we have been set free from sin. We're no longer bound slaves. That means no Christian should ever be down, walk with their noses and their faces downtrodden, down to the ground. Oh, I'm so awful. I'm terrible. There's nothing that I can do. I'm just the worst thing. I don't know if God could ever forgive me. No, the reality is, is God forgives you. Just give it to him. Let him take it. You don't have to carry it anymore. If people want to look at your past life and your past sin, after you've found redemption, you've changed, your spirit's changed, everything in your life is changing, and people try and continually bring up those things, you need to, that's when you look at them and say, no, no, I am redeemed. I am no longer that person. I am no longer bound in sin. And, and we don't and, and we, we, we don't need to be troubled by that anymore because see we are free and we are free indeed and and only Satan desires for us to be feel uncertainty in that promise. 
Only Satan desires to tread us down and tear us down and tell us how awful we are. Only Satan will do that. But Jesus, our Lord and our Savior, lifts us up. He lifts us up and restores us. He lifts us up as we turn our hearts to him. He lifts us up and we are redeemed. We are renewed. We are alive. So let your hope lie in that promise and that promise alone because God is that good. God is that wonderful. He's not sitting in heaven waiting to just smite you. Uh, he's not He's, he's, he's not holding his finger over the smite button going, yes, I win. <laughs> no, 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 no. God is forgiving. God is loving. God is restoring. And he is restoring all of us. And that is his promise. And that is his hope. So I hope you enjoyed this study. Uh, there's so much more to go through in here, I know. And I don't, uh, I know I've gone through quite a bit. But I do hope that this is uplifting for you. And I look forward to seeing you again. Uh, make sure, if there's any questions or any things that comes up, just put it in the comments. And uh, I'll see them. Others will see them too. And it may open the doors to be able to have greater discussion. Deepen the faith. Let us pray for one another. Lift one another up in the promises. Let's not be afraid of what we see in our world. But let us... Let us lay, lay our hands at our feet. Let us get on our knees. Let us pray and turn it all over to our Lord, who is the great Redeemer, because he's in control. He's still on the throne. He's going to stay on the throne. Nobody can knock him off. But we, we are his people, and just trust in that and his mercy. Have yourself a great and glorious rest of your week. God bless you and fill you with his Holy Spirit. God bless. Talk to you again soon.